All right, everybody, welcome to the SSD slash um, Muscle Engineer podcast. So Tak Andre is my partner, and um, we haven't done these in a while because the COVID quarantine madness has eased up a little bit. But uh, we thought let's get on another podcast and chat about some cool stuff. So Andre, Andras, how are you? I'm very good. Um, you know, mine is the fact that my throat is a bit sore, which uh, is not COVID. I don't <laughs> think so. Because <laughs> apparently it's seasonal because uh, memory popped up a couple of days ago, but, you know, technically a week ago or something like that, that exactly one year from that uh, day, I was actually sick back then too. So, you know, back then we didn't have this threat. So it was just like, well, it's a cold, no big deal now. You know, if you cough or something, everyone just looks at you like... <laughs> there's be, there's been a meme that, you know, a year ago you coughed to cover up a fart and now you fart to cover <laughs> up a, a cough, which is yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it is pretty wild because, I mean, every year when the cold season starts, I will get chronically, not sick, but I just get into that thing where I have a bit of a cough or I have a runny nose and then I mega dose some vitamins i pay a lot of attention to stay warm and then it goes away and then it comes back goes away and that it's just chronic because it's just my body is just chronically cold <laughs> like, like it's really mm. hard to stay warm and in the summer it's warm plus like vitamin d levels and all of those things and i tend to forget to supplement with vitamin d which is not smart but yeah it's pretty wild because normally it's like yeah well it's just what happens but now when i have it it's like oh man what if i have it you know so it's kind of annoying but yeah you know uh back a couple of months ago you know everyone just said that oh well do you know someone who has it well now it turns out i do um not you know very people who are very close to me but sort of acquaintances basically people who i know uh apparently have it and uh, all they had pretty much has been a loss of smell and taste for like two to three weeks something like that so there's no big deal, which is interesting. <laughs> Another thing that's interesting is uh, in a small village next to our village, there's been sort of a uh, breakout, basically. There's been some sort of factory, and pretty much all the workers got infected. So there's been like 30, 40 people. And you can imagine these are not like youngsters. They are like, you know, 50, I would imagine 50, 55, 60 year old men and women. And apparently no one had anything serious like it was just you know like a, a cold or something like that I, I assume that they had fever or something like that and you know they stayed a couple of days in bed but pretty much everyone has recovered just fine so again this sort of makes me you know question not necessarily the severity of it but simply the exaggerate over exaggerated uh, measures that governments seem to be taking <laughs> Yeah, actually, if, if all goes well, then next week I will have a podcast episode on COVID with someone that I'm very excited to interview. A uh, bit of a surprise, um, but it's yeah, it's really hard to just go off of infer like things that you hear because I'm also hearing stories like what you just said. At the same time, I just communicated with someone who had family members die from COVID. Granted, they were old, older people, um, oh. so obviously we always knew that that, that they are more susceptible. And one of my like very good childhood friends who we are in daily contact with, and uh, he had COVID not long ago, and he was healed, quote unquote, in like two, three weeks. But some of the things that he experienced actually speak of what I heard from other sources as well, that it has some longer lasting effects on various things. Like even after two weeks of being quote unquote healed from COVID, like he didn't have fever anymore, but he still went on a walk and he just felt like exhausted and he just felt weird all the time. So uh, it's, it's really hard because you hear one thing which sounds so reasonable mm -hmm. and then you hear the polar opposite, which also sounds reasonable. And admittedly, I kept myself away from COVID related information <laughs> for a while because uh, it just made me angry and annoyed and you know all the comments <laughs> under any given post even more annoying so it's it's just uh, it's just wild so I just I just really hope that at least I will be able to ignore it in the coming period because yeah. they won't introduce all kinds of ridiculous measures which force me to you know read about it and all of that stuff yeah I'm the same I try to live my life as uninterrupted as possible basically so aside from you know having to put a mask on every time i go buy groceries or something like that is 
it hasn't I can't say that it has affected my life in any significant way aside from the fact that you know there are far fewer people coming to the gym and there is a limit to how many people can be there at the same time and I have far fewer clients simply because there are fewer people in the city um but aside from that it's you know we, we are still able to train um we are healthy so that's all good but you know there is some concerns that the government might shut down gyms again which <laughs> hopefully won't happen but they have closed restaurants and movie theaters again um yeah. and you you've seen sort of my discussion in by instagram with mike who's like yeah well maybe things will ease up i'm like uh, no <laughs> not over here yeah i mean not to go on a huge rant about this uh, but yeah just recently there were news that from now on wearing masks even outside will be mandatory and you will be fined if you don't wear them which uh, obviously made me pissed off because that's i mean it's just so silly to me it's really hard to justify i mean Obviously, even they probably wouldn't say that if you're taking a walk outside and there is not a single soul around you anywhere, then you're protecting anybody from wearing that mask. But obviously, it's hard to impose a rule where, okay, if you go to a crowded place, then you have to wear it. If you're alone, then you don't have to wear it. Like you ha They have to draw the line somewhere. Um, but I would much rather take that than another lockdown, obviously. So that's more along the lines of living together with the virus versus just completely paralyzing life altogether. And the other thing is just yesterday I read that here in Macedonia, from now on, uh, I don't know if it, this is like already in place, but police will be able to enter your building at any time to basically check on you if you have more guests than what's allowed. What? Which that that's like real dictatorship like uh, loading in yeah that's... exactly i mean what the hell you can't just you need a war if you need a warrant to go into someone's place yeah apparently not anymore yeah i mean i'm not the conspiracy type but that's seriously bordering on the line of on the edge of totalitarianism yeah. <laughs> i mean that's how they that's how you lose your freedoms like one step at a time oh we're just going to enter your your apartment without any warrant just check if there are more people inside than than you're allowed to have what <laughs> yeah and, and if you think about it it's all been like very gradual like that's um that's how you break people or basically you accommodate them to okay like this is a serious situation so we need to take drastic measures okay that didn't work then we need to take an even more drastic measures so you know it started off with okay we need to close things down then it's okay like you have to wear a mask outside if you don't do it then you'll get fined next thing is this and what will be after that so like i'm not i'm not saying that this is actually some political conspiracy stuff but it's slowly getting to the point where we see enough things where if you if you're not at least somewhat open to that idea, I think you're actually being stubborn in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I don't know. Mike to me seems to be <laughs> exactly in that category. As I've seen some comments from people, and he's been like, you know, well, yeah, well, you know, government and I don't know which country they are not so politically incentivized, and they still did that. And I think there is some amount of monkey see, monkey do going on. I mean, I'm sure that Romania is in that category. It's not like, you know, Romanian leadership is so, uh, you know, independently thinking and critical thinking and, and that sort of stuff. I think they just simply copy what Germany or Italy or Spain does or something like that. But yeah, those bigger countries, like bigger economies like Germany or France or Italy or Spain, um, I don't know what they are doing, <laughs> or in the UK even, because I heard that there are some concerning issues over there too. Yeah, yeah, but again, it's uh, I, I'm looking forward to that podcast that I will be doing with this guy who actually did analysis on all of this, because there's a couple of things that I just cannot reconcile. Like on the one hand, you hear that lockdowns appear to have like no significant impact, but but at the same time, I mean, what do you say to the thing that happened in you know Italy? Or I even heard that Switzerland had a collapsed medical system for a while. And here in Macedonia, I'm hearing things from people that work in the ER department that uh, they're running out of places. So it's pretty messed up. So like, what's the explanation then? Like, is it something that happens in like every year? And it's just now that we're talking about it? Or what do I do with that information? So yeah, some things to understand for sure. Yeah. Anyway, I just keep coming back to that quote that Jordan said. 
uh, I think in his first uh, Joe Rogan interview when he said, you know, how do societies go corrupt one small step at a time? <laughs> and that's pretty much how your freedoms are being taken away. How how do they take away they, you know, how does a corrupt government, if they so wish, take your freedoms away? Like one small step at a time. Just push a bit, then you get accustomed to that new normal, and then they push again. You get you get accustomed to that, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Early enough, like you you wake up and you be like, well, I have nothing left. It's basically China. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I really hope that Mike is right. Oh, this is all temporary, and it's gonna be so much better so soon. But and that's the other thing I commented on his wall uh, on one of the posts that he made that we are all waiting for the vaccine, like the second coming of Jesus. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, and, and I'm just going to repeat it for the listeners. Like, okay, we hear all these things about us not getting immunity from being infected once. So, okay, you got infected and you got healed. That doesn't mean anything. You can get it again. Then why do we expect that the vaccine would do anything different? Like, I, I mean, and there might be something which I'm not understanding here about, like, pharmacology and how these vaccines work, but... I no, mean, <laughs> that's how vaccines work. Like, they basically, they give you a small enough dose for your... Uh, natural defense system to detect it and then you start producing those antibodies and the concern is that if you get infected like with the real deal it's gonna overwhelm your system but it's not like it works any different I mean and if you've been exposed to the actual real thing real deal real thing whatever and you've been you know you survived it but you don't get immunity from that then the vaccine is not gonna do anything yeah, and like, so would you be shocked if a year from now, or let's say, let's say we get the vaccine in in April, then in like June or July, it's like, oh well, people, that we are in really big trouble because it, apparently it still doesn't grant us immunity. So even further research is needed, and in the meantime, we need to put these and these measures in place and lock down again. Like, would you be shocked if that happened? I, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um... I am still hopeful that people, <laughs> like, at th that point, it's really gonna look like something pre-planned. Like, if that sort of starts happening, oh, we're just gonna lock down things whenever we wish. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I don't think people are going to just, you know, accept that willingly. At least I hope so. Yeah, yeah, well, anyway, um, we, could, we could rant about this for a while, and maybe not super wisely because none of us are like formal experts on this but um anyway so um we could start out with a couple of things so you mentioned a few things that are on your mind um which one do you, which which one is something that's bugging you the most yeah so i sort of wanted to address a bit the recent uh you know roundtable discussion or whatever it was with mike and eric which was great by the way mm on the whole volume issue and, you know, whether you should increase sets or progress load or that sort of a stuff and sort of tie that into the, I guess, series of posts Chris Barakat has been making recently, which I'm sure enough, I'm sure that, you know, Chris is a very nice guy in person, that sort of stuff. This is anything personal. It's just we've both sort of been rolling our eyes at his posts um, when he started the... Uh, uh, with this narrative that uh, basically the you, the reason that you're not as big as you want to be as you would like to be is because your mindset is holding you back and you know like basically you you don't dare uh to dream big enough and sort of your 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 uh you're happy or fulfilled with that one pound per year of muscle and the only reason that you don't gain more is because you don't expect more. And if you only just expected 15 pounds in eight weeks, you could gain 15 pounds of muscle. But instead, you you just... Okay, he didn't say that. <laughs> well, it's not he didn't say that, but that was basically the tone. I mean, and then his whole client transformations with guy who gains like seven pounds of lean body mass and his fat mass went down in eight weeks or something like that. These ridiculous... I just and I, I just roll my eyes so hard because I, I actually did some cardio last night. I was thinking about this sort of in anticipation of this, and I was like, you know, I was thinking that people sort of make it out to be as if you know these people who are at the best of the best, 
like as if they start like everyone else and you know they just barely make any progress and they just slowly put on a 1.25 kilo plate here and there and then you know they never give up and they believe and they they sacrifice to win and then one day they become you know like elite or become the world champions and it's no <laughs> like that's not how it works the best like right away the best simply d distance themselves from the pack like a guy who has a propensity to put on muscle mass is gonna look like a different person in six months like just look up the uh quinton area or whatever quinton beastwood or something like that on instagram uh what's his name greg you said did a net or not video on him six months in guy looked better than i do in you know after 10 years of lifting <laughs> <laughs> like the strongest people, like Greg Knuckles, or um, do you like? Do you really believe that Haftier, for example, went into the gym and he started deadlifting the empty bar, like us did, or started bench pressing the empty bar? Like, do you really believe that, or you know Eddie Hall or one of those guys, and he just you know started putting on 2.5 kilo plates, and suddenly he got up to 480 kilos or 501 or whatever in Haftier's case? Like those guys, I'm sure pulled like. 180 200 in the first day of at the gym <laughs> that's not how it works the best aren't the best because they oh they had this amazing self-belief and they never gave up no they just pushed hard just like any of us do and they just simply were way better and <laughs> their heart became you know i don't know 10 kilo each week or and ours is like one kilo or something like that and the same with muscle mass it's it's not like you you make these because as that's what annoys me right because i've been training for almost 10 years now or nine years or something like that and chris almost makes it out to be as if you know if you only started believing after 10 years you could start making like these phenomenal gains and you could put on like 10 pounds in a year and no that's not how it works you don't get it's not like these lead become you know they sort of put on like you know five to ten pounds a year and then on year seven they started believing and they put on 20. <laughs> like no they put on probably like 25 30 pounds in the first year and and within two to three years they were already like almost there where they are right now <laughs> i mean just listen to eric helms for example he said the same thing that like he put on i don't know 25 30 pounds in the first year and eric is not even by far he's not the freakest of the freaks and that's sort of what annoys me <laughs> and i'll let you talk as well but this is just it's something that makes me want to drive this you know a screwdriver in my eyes just when i see those posts it's like oh if only you believe oh shut the fuck up <laughs> if only i believed yeah i mean there is so much to that and the first thing is on the chris barricade thing so i will actually try to get him on um and this is something that. So it's really ironic that you mention him because this morning actually Eric Helms reached out to me in a very like constructive, like non-offensive manner, even though he could have. And basically he pointed out that the recent video I did on Chris Barakat's claims or I portrayed him a bit unfairly because and admittedly, this is something that even I thought about when making that video that, OK, a guy who puts on, you know, nine kilos in eight weeks, it doesn't imply that all of them pounds. Them was pounds. No, he said kilograms. Um, <laughs> Nine kilos. Yeah, so he went on the oh. podcast of Dave McConey. And I didn't listen to that. Yeah, so um, so there was that original post that kind of uh, made us raise our eyebrows, which was a guy dropping significant, significant amounts of body fat and gaining like seven pounds of stage, or not stage weight, scale weight. So just very, very incredible body recomposition and then he discussed that on Dave McConey's podcast and then he mentioned that he has seen an even crazier transformation where a guy in eight weeks dropped his body fat by like two kilos and gained nine kilos yeah, right. of body of lean body mass and and I pointed out in that video that basically my message was that I'm I don't think Chris is lying because I I don't think he would make claims like that just to be like famous or just to sell products or whatever because he's a scientist. I'm sure he cares about his reputation. But I would say that this guy going on a Diana Ball cycle for eight weeks and putting on a whole bunch of lean body mass and also like water weight, of course, is while it's unlikely, but it's still more likely than this is a legitimate story. But admittedly, I actually wanted to mention also that it, it also could be that the guy was like on a freaking carnivore diet before. 
and then maybe he gained like two, three kilos in eight weeks, which, you know, some freaks could do that. Put on two, three more kilos of glycogen and, you know, body water and maybe some other weight, scale weight fluctuations by some other things, which can happen to some people. So, you know, there are other scenarios and I guess kind of the whole YouTube, let's be a bit more polarizing, a bit more controversial for the views that got me, got to me a little bit. So I, I'm realizing that I was a bit unfair. But um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you that you know, all these posts about, you know, only the, this mindset is holding you back or whatever. I think in a way, it's almost insulting to people like us who have done all of those things, you know, like we had the good mindset, we had the grinding mentality, we had the consistency, like all of the things that these people talk about. And then when they say that that's the thing that's holding you back, it's like, well, like, screw you, like, uh and to me personally, it's mm. just annoying because I know that these people also know that that's kind of BS and it's just inherently annoying to see someone saying something which you know is incorrect. It's sort of like if you go out with your buddies to a bar and you see your friend who is like the biggest loser in the world, like picking up the hottest chick in the world with some com completely fake story, like Barney in How I Met Your Mother, if you watch that, <laughs> like... Like, yeah, I'm working at NASA and whatever. I, was, I have this Ferrari that I'm driving. And the girl is like, oh, my God. And that was like your dream girl. Like, you will be annoyed. Like, God damn it, this girl could be with me. But this guy is making up this bullshit. So it, part of it is just that. But honestly, I don't. And this is something I talk about with Dave a lot. I don't understand why this whole genetics thing is such a taboo thing in this industry. I, I personally don't understand because... I myself, yeah, it's a bit discouraging to hear that at first, but like that didn't stop me from still lifting and still trying to develop my physique to that my body's potential. And and I don't know, like people are just seem to be so averse to be talking about that and they will talk about everything else. And um sorry, I, I will let you talk in a second, but r just recently Dave McConey had Brian Whitaker on his podcast and they were talking about the lean body mass and the FFMI of Lane Norton and Doug Miller. And Brian Whitaker went on the, like the prototypical classic like rant that I don't know if these people think that that's what's expected of them, but he started saying like, well, it sounds unbelievable that these guys, these guys can get to that level of muscularity naturally. But if you have seen these guys work and they're so consistent and they are so precise with their nutrition and Dave, to his credit, it's amazing that he does that every time. He said, like, I just want to point it out to people that the reason why Doug Miller has more fat-free mess than you, Brian, is not because he's more consistent than you, or it's not because he is more precise with his nutrition, it's because of genetics. And Brian immediately agreed with him, like, they didn't even push back the slightest bit. So I just don't get, like, why do you go on that monologue in the first place if you agree? Uh, it, ju it just confuses me, honestly. <laughs> I think it's political correctness. And as far as what you said that, you know, where Chris is a scientist, let's not forget that Jacob Wilson was also a scientist and sure. Barbario is also a scientist. So, yeah, um, I don't, I'm not, not making any accusation. I'm just saying that that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely not proof, but it's, uh, again, it's like probabilistic thinking from my end. So that's um, the likelihood of these things happening. Like Jacob Wilson is like, you know, one in a thousand, like at least in this small niche of like evidence-based practitioners that we follow who will get into shady shit like that. Yeah. So, Yeah, but but then see, he's, he's what? He's, he really believes those results or he's just simply naive or what's going on? Because, <laughs> you know, otherwise there is no real explanation. I mean, going back to that hard work thing, I, you've seen my colleague, uh, those who don't know, I'm anyone who wants to reach out, I can send them photos of him. He won last uh, last year. He won the IMBA European Championship and he got his PMBA Pro card. I mean, he's not gonna like realistically, he's not gonna win probably WMBF Worlds, but I'm fairly confident he would place top ten for sure, maybe top five. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you've seen him; he's just fantastic. Then why is it? I mean, the, the like I'm not exaggerating. The guy eats like a robot. I mean, he has no quote-unquote cheat meals. He doesn't eat junk food. He doesn't eat sugar. He eats, uh, you know, frequent protein feedings, that sort of stuff. If there is one guy who really has everything put into the gym, and yeah, training-wise, I 
you know, we've had discussions. I think he could train maybe a bit more, maybe a bit more frequently, but neither here nor there. Why is it then that back in 2015, his stage weight was like 78 kilos or 77, and last year he was like 79? <laughs> in four years, his stage weight went up maybe two kilos. Maybe. Why is it then? He if you know the guy, if you would have known, like if if you really like talk to him, he's like the most self-confident, or I don't know if he's delusional, but he's basically he holds himself at at a high regard that that's pretty much as high as as a regard as possible. Like basically, like he views himself far better than other people simply due to his work ethic and that sort of a stuff. Which you could say that's a flaw, but in this case, I think it's a positive. So if there is a person who could go beyond those quote unquote genetic limitations simply by virtue of hard work and mindset and belief, it would be him. <laughs> And he hasn't put on like these, ins like he's put on maybe a couple of kilos. Um, and I think, and he agreed with me, I think that's simply been due to not over dieting and just being more patient and staying leaner year round. So having to diet less. Yeah. So that's basically what happened. Like he maintained more muscle on the way down. It's not necessarily that he put on more during the off season. So <laughs> I'm asking Chris, how, why? Like, if really these, it's really, if it's an issue of just, you know, it's just self-limiting beliefs, great. And why hasn't he gone up to 85 kilos on stage, for example? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, I, I think there are a couple of issues there. So the first thing is that obviously that message that Chris is talking about and, and a lot of these people like work ethic, your self-image, like those things can definitely make the difference between someone like being out of shape, like just not getting anywhere in the gym and like being overweight and things like that versus being in shape. Like absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to go from like a physique that's, you know, what you have or I have to a physique that's, I would say even Steve Hall has, for example, who has, um, I, I will speak for myself, he's more gifted genetically than I am. Um, like that will not be a matter of work ethic. That's like, and and then that's not even an extreme example. If I picked out someone like a Joshua Kenyon, you know, the three D M J athlete, that's like, you know, that's yeah. ridiculous out of the question. Maybe I should come up with a better example because obviously everybody accuses him of using juice, which I don't think is the case. But uh, so it's it's tricky because probably those posts are not meant for people like you and me, and that's um, Dave likes to talk about it as well, like that if he had great genetics for building muscle, which actually I think he has decent genetics, he likes to think that he has like the shittest genetics in the world, um, mm. then he would probably be one of those like cocky, ignorant people who is accusing everybody who doesn't have his physique with not working hard enough. Because he really killed himself in the gym from the get-go. Like he did those like 20 sets, two failure, high rep, like deathly, leg workouts like he actually did all of those things it just happened he just happened to not respond as favorably to weight training as some of these freaks so he had to humble yeah. himself that okay it's not just hard work but you know a lot of these people yeah they work really hard and they also respond well to weight training so it's it's easy to make the conclusion that well like hard work gets you a long way and then you know there comes a guy like me or you who really like we have been in this for like 10 years give or take we did like a lot of yeah. things right and we're very consistent and we are like nowhere near like some of these guys are and it's you know we just roll our eyes at it so yeah so i think the best example of this is that conversation i showed you <laughs> so, so just to explain it to the listeners basically i posted uh, one of chris bumstead's physique updates to my stories and obviously if chris bumstead is <laughs> classic physique mr olympia and the girl who uh, was you know used to go to our gym responded that oh you if only you dieted if you know if you only you were this more disciplined with your diet you would look like that too <laughs> and, and i started laughing because she, what she meant was you know if you if you you know brought your body fat levels down you could look you know relatively speaking the same in that you you would have nice round delts and you would have abs and, and i was like yeah sure i would look the same except you know i would have maybe 35 kilos <laughs> less yeah. muscle mass <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah like that's i i got the uh, that's basically the perfect example of this like yeah the message in and of itself is a positive one like she meant well and i appreciate that but he's fucking mr olympia for a reason like even drugs aside which <laughs> you know there's that joke 
uh, I posted a couple of times, there's a meme of, you know, money aside, what do you need in your life? That money you put aside. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically, the, like, drugs aside, which you can't just put aside because they make up the huge uh, portion of the game. Like, even if I took the drugs that he does or more, I could probably gain, you know, maybe 10 kilos more, but I would still have a deficit of like 20 to 25 kilos of muscle mass compared to him, at least 15. And I think that 15 is simply the genetic difference because we are similar in height. I think he's around six feet as well. So, and even if we were the same stat, like if we were the same height and the same body weight, he would look different simply because of muscle bellies and that sort of stuff. So that's the other thing that you can't, no amount of hard work can change your clavicle size and your hip uh, you know circumference and the way your your muscles look and that sort of stuff so i mean like you said i think it's just either political correctness or people wanting to pat themselves on the back like people are i don't know they're weird like for example there's a guy at our gym who used to lie about his drug use and was just comical and there is uh, that guy i showed you today who uh, is competing and is very open about his use who <laughs> kept constantly making fun of them oh here are the natural guys <laughs> there were two of them and he knew full well that they were taking and this guy um you know he went uh, like basically he said that he hasn't trained uh, once since march basically since the gym's lockdown and i've seen at least five or six times stories of him lifting in various gyms and that's only just me casually grabbing or seeing a couple of his stories, like, I, I wasn't following him, like, why would you lie, <laughs> like, you know, it's simply because he wanted to appear cooler than he is, and he wanted to show that, oh, look at me, I'm, I still look uh, uh, this great, even without training, like, that's just blatantly lying, and I can show you, like, another 10 examples of that, so, people are weird, and uh, I think it's the same with the genetic thing, that people uh, sort of imagine that if you admit that you have great genetics, then you sort of uh, start to downplay the effort you put into it, or they take it sort of personally that, you know, you're sort of accusing them of being lazy and just, uh, you know, using their genetics, which, of, of course, can also happen, because I have a friend who's just like that. Um, he has this huge structure, I literally... I, I'm not exaggerating, he could easily be 100 kilos and lean, like easily, he's maybe 110 right now, but he's, you know, he has some body fat to lose, <laughs> but he has this insane structure, he's like 190 centimeters tall, something like that, but huge delts, like very, very big bone structure, he could easily be 100 kilos and lean, not just, you know, 100 kilos of <laughs> fluff. Yeah, I'm honestly really curious what my brother could achieve if he got into lifting seriously. So he was a swimmer when he was a kid from like age five until age like 12 or something. Uh, he was actually a big talent. So he was, they were, his coaches were talking about like he could go to the Olympics one day or whatever. Or whatever. And then he just stopped because he got lazy. <laughs> and so he is, um, and he has like never freaking picked up a dumbbell in his entire life. And he like... You know, he's the same height as me, so like meter 83. And ba basically his entire life, he looked like he he was like a casual lifter. Not someone who is like super, super hardcore into it, but, you know, decent body fat levels, like big arms, big shoulders. And so I remember at a weight where he was like, he didn't have abs or anything like that, but he looked like definitely not like fat or anything like that. He also has a good body fat distribution. So his ass and his legs got like pretty chubby when he puts on weight and his stomach still stays mm -hmm. like flat. But he was like always like 90 kilos, you know, at that height <laughs> and, and like in shape, you know, mm -hmm. if, if me before lifting, I mean, when I was out of shape, I was like 85 kilos and like pretty fat, you know, <laughs> and even now if I'm 90 kilos, I'm not lean. <laughs> yeah, same. So, so it is, it is pretty crazy. So I'm really curious what he could actually achieve, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, and to be honest, the whole drugs and genetics, I lumped those two things into the same category. Like, and this is what Mike talked about when he did the steroid episode with him. Like if you see a guy with phenomenal, a phenomenal physique, like two options, either he has phenomenal genetics or he uses drugs or both like, and from your perspective, does it really matter which one is the case? Like, yeah. no, because do you have drugs? No. Do you have phenomenal genetics? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. What do you say about AJ Morris? And I didn't want to get into him, sort of, but 
dude, that guy is really inspiring. Uh, maybe that's someone we should get on the podcast to talk because that guy is just so inspiring. I mean, his work ethic and, um, you know, the amount of progress he's made in the last three years has just been phenomenal. And, you know, we sort of discussed this in private. I do believe that uh, uh, yeah, he obviously had the genetic room to grow, but I think AJ is an example of someone who who really achieves sort of, <laughs> you know, it's like in Dragon Ball, like he achieved a higher level of Super Saiyan. <laughs> he didn't even think he could go into. And I do, I do believe that sort of environment and that sort of stuff makes a difference. Like I'm not, like I'm fairly confident that I could make better gains by being in a gym like his, by being surrounded by people like the guys he trains with. Like, but the only thing is, I'm not naive to believe that that's gonna sort of, you know, make me gain like 10 pounds. Maybe I could gain another kilo extra. Like, I don't think that's gonna, that's gonna make me turn into like, win any sort of, you know, natural bodybuilding competitions anytime soon. But I do believe that that um, environment sort of makes a difference. It's just not gonna be as big of a difference as some people like to think or, you know, make it out to be. But hey, I mean, AJ has put on like, I'm not even sure, maybe almost 20 pounds, 18 pounds in three years, something like that. It's just crazy. But that's three years. It's not, <laughs> it's not 10 weeks, you know, and that's like three years of just brutal effort and consistency and really hard work and just he said it himself that like he basically dedicated to, those three years have been just poured into bodybuilding and every single aspect of it has been covered and yeah and most people don't really have that luxury but it's just to me he's been really inspiring to watch um and i didn't I, like i'm not this huge fan i don't watch his video updates sorry aj <laughs> uh, i just you know watch the pictures but to me he's He's a great example of how natural should diet. Like, I'm sorry, Mike, but um, yeah, drugs aside, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that. I, I think the approach sort of AJ takes of, you know, doing a bit less sets or, you know, fewer sets and putting all your effort into those sets is going to be better for natural than, you know, just sandbagging and doing your MRVs and shit. And that's coming for someone who did that for, like, you know me, like, I've been the biggest Mike not hugger for, like, years. <laughs> I went, like, that's that's why it's so funny to me now that when I see, you know, this, uh, someone who's basically me, like, five years ago, who, you know, just came across Mike and is super excited and, oh, well, MRV, this is how you gotta train because that's how you're gonna overcome your limits. And I'm like, mm, nah, <laughs> your limit is still your limit. And I'm sorry, but aside from Blind McDonald's, I don't hear too many people talking about it, but that's the real unfortunate um, uh, reality that your limit is your limit and you can paradise your training. You can do this, you can do that. You're still gonna end up in the same place and it is what it is. Yeah, I also don't follow AJ Morris that closely, but I have been aware of him for, for years, but I followed Steve's journey more closely. And I would actually love to get him and Steve on, or like Steve and AJ Morris on at the same time and have a bit of a, a discussion with them. I would suspect that AJ's story is a little bit similar to Steve's, where Steve was a guy who in 2016-17, which is kind of the time that I came across him, he already had a very impressive physique. He was lean, he was well-developed, he did even well on stage. And I honestly think that he started competing a, a bit too early. And by too early, I don't mean that he shouldn't have competed. It's just purely from a maximizing your muscular potential as quickly as possible perspective. He started competing a bit early. I think he did a little bit too good of a job at keeping himself very lean in the offseason. Maybe he didn't allow himself long enough gaining phases. So I think he was a guy with good genetics who held himself back a little bit. And that holding himself back still resulted in a very impressive physique because because he has good genetics. So I would suspect that with AJ Morris, something like that was going on as well. Like, um, like there is no magic in, in biology and, and fitness. Like if you 
gained you know 15 plus pounds in three years that still means that you were not an advanced lifter like it's 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 um and if you have a really impressive physique and you're natural that means you have good genetics like there is no there are no magic scenarios where you don't have good genetics but you still develop the physique of someone who has good genetics like that it doesn't work like that it's sort of like saying can someone be like two meter 20 centimeters tall and be short. It's like, <laughs> well, no, it, those two things sort of contradict each other. Um, so I do think that's the case. But yeah, what did impress me when I listened to AJ and Steve talk on a podcast is it really seems like they are people who actually pay attention to their own bodies. So they're not committing to ideas, they are committing to results, and they're committing to what they observe is appears to be working for them. So I, I th- and I think that's something to really take at heart. And I also think that mindset and also environment definitely plays a factor. It's not going to like make or break your physique. So it's not going to take you from someone who has like a subpar physique to looking like a freak. That's not going to happen. Yeah. But yeah, that extra edge, it can definitely give you like to, to just give my example. I'm someone who was very consistent for many years now and was and definitely a hardworking individual when it comes to fitness. But one thing I never did was these like hardcore, like puking out your guts type uh, leg workouts. I never did that. Like I, I never did five sets of heavy squats, very near failure. And then five sets of leg presses where like literally I'm almost failing the last reps. I never did that because like, fuck that man. Like that's, that's <laughs> hell. So, and maybe if I did that, I could eke out a little bit more on my lower body. So that's absolutely a reality. And also there is definitely something to be said for being, just blind about the fact that you may be nearing your genetic potential and pushing really hard anyway. And just that stubbornness might be able to take you a couple of extra, maybe not miles, but inches at least. And and this is a conversation I had with Dave McConey a few times where um, he's almost offended when someone mentions the whole like, you're not working hard enough thing. And that's why you're not looking like X thing. And he's 100% right about that. For the most part, that's horseshit. And I had no doubts that he really killed himself for a long time. And this is as far as he got. And that's like training twice a day and doing it six days a week and doing this and that and high volumes, that would not make any additional difference. That's you know 100% possible, not just possible, that's likely. But I I pointed it out to him and he kind of got annoyed at me, which I understand, but I pointed out that, you know, maybe if you had the mindset of, okay, like, no, there, I still have a lot of gains left to make and you would be pushing as hard as you possibly could for another two years. Yes, you wouldn't put on 10 more pounds of muscle, but maybe you would put on an extra two pounds of muscle, which you didn't expect. Like that, that could be. Um, But I understand if he gets annoyed at me for that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's not like... (laughs) <laughs> like you said this earlier, it's not like we just, you know, oh, well, we cross our arms and just, you know, start, you know, like Jordan says, you know, start cursing God and the the existence that, oh, well, I haven't been blessed with good genetics or whatever, or great genetics, but I think I have, I have okay genetics. I think I am on the broad scale of human existence, probably I'm, I'm, I'm average. Like, I have some body parts that are better than average, and some my chest just sucks balls. <laughs> but it is what it is. But on overall, I think I have, you know, I'm okay, I'm average. Like, with someone who, if, if if an average individual puts in 10 years of proper lifting, I think they can get there. Not most people, and definitely a lot of people can get far better gains. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's I'm you know, I'm sort of happy, and I'm at the point where... Um, you know, most people will look at me, especially now that I'm starting to get leaner, that, oh, yeah, it looks good. It's not going to make you wow, but it's also not going to, you know, start people looking at you like, Ugh, what's that monstrosity? Because <laughs> there's, you know, if I started taking drugs, you know, the past a certain point, there is that uh, balance, tipping point where people just look at you like you're some sort of freak show. But just, you know, appreciating this more, things like, you know, we discussed this back in May or so that I sort of had a fall off, fall off basically with my diet in May, um, and which is something I want to get touch on a bit later. But back in April, I I think I was 86.5 kilos at my lowest. And now t- this morning I was 86.9 and maybe I'm just delusional. Yeah. So I have to take some pictures, but I think I'm a bit leaner. 
um, than in, in April at, you know, a marginally higher body weight or even at the same body weight, let's say. But seems to me that I'm somewhat leaner, which again is not something to, you know, <laughs> brag about or, you know, start, uh, you know, putting out these posts about how mindset and my genetics have been altered. Simply, it's, you know, small, small steps and those do add up and it's not like uh, I gave up. It's not like I stopped training. I still expect to gain some muscle. I said the same thing to, to my colleague. I said, you know, I hope that I have a good maybe five kilos left in my entire life <laughs> but that's like five kilos in maybe 10 years 15 years i'm not expecting those five i mean and with another five kilos i would look just i mean five kilos of my pure muscle that's whoa <laughs> that's a different physique like especially put in the right places so perhaps my chest gets a bit bigger and you know my my delts and stuff not all goes to my legs which you know, will still, of course, be appreciated, but it's not the most rewarding <laughs> place to put your, your muscle on. Uh, that would be nice. So it's not like we just give up. It's just we are at the same time sort of, you know, cognizant and aware that, uh, yeah, there's a thing called genetics. And uh, we just get annoyed when people sort of start downplaying that uh, sort of uh, forgotten variable, I guess. Yeah, uh, speaking of uh, like your physique and genetics, it's it's really funny. Just like you and I, in terms of stats, are like very very similar. Yeah, like similar height, and then or the same height, and then you know when you're at different body fat percentages, we weigh roughly the same amount. Like when you're at fifteen percent, you will weigh roughly as much as when I am. Um, you have that picture from a couple of years back when you're maybe like around the ten percent body fat mark, and what were you weighing then? Like eighty kilos, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, I weighed the same amount at that time, roughly at same body fat. So, um, so that's one thing. But like the way in which we are gifted or not gifted is so entirely different. Like, um, like my, I have like a pretty average like body fat distribution. Like most males, I hold a bit more on my stomach, but my stomach gets pretty lean if I'm even under like twenty percent body fat. Um, I my strong point is my chest basically, and my back is like my i mean my i would say my biceps is my worst body part in that it's just like small but my back i would say is like just underdeveloped like from the back if i do a double back bicep pose it's like it takes off a, like three four years of my training age if you look at me from that uh -huh. angle <laughs> and it's really funny because like your back is and and your shoulders like you have like borderline like juiced up looking shoulders and your back is like really well developed like you have thickness to your back and like your rear de deltoids that's the other funny thing so i like every evening before i go take a shower i stand in my living room and i hold like this handheld mirror in my hand and i'm checking out my back in the mirror behind me and it's like, oh, yeah, actually, I have some rear delts. Like, look, like there is like this <laughs> like this thing emerging there. It's like, okay, I'm actually not that far. And sometimes I check your picture with your rear delts. And it's like, fuck. I, <laughs> I, I always forget like like the difference, you know, because when I see yours, it's like, it's not that there is something emerging there. You have like a fucking like bowling ball there. Like, it's like you, your shoulder has like another shoulder behind it. So it, it's just really crazy. So it's not just about like how much you weigh and whatever, but like two similarly genetically gifted people in terms of just pure muscle mass can still look like drastically different so yeah that's what i said that you know stats don't really matter all that much i mean it's nice for you just to evaluate progress but you can't com you can't compare two people between them simply by looking at it's not like it's not like bodybuilding shows or you know you, well you just step on the stage uh, on the scale i mean and oh you're heavier so you you're winning the contest <laughs> that's not how it works and yeah um my real dads are i, I think you you've been the first guy who actually pointed that out like i knew my side darts were good but that's just because you know i see them and you know i sort of pay more attention to them and my real darts are it's not like i strain them a lot but you were sort of the, I think, the first one to point out that yeah, they are pretty well, pretty well developed, and actually they are quite a strong body part. Um, but the only thing is, you know, if you like, if you're imagine if your best body part was hamstrings, yeah, like yeah, it's nice, but who the fuck cares? Like one in a hundred people, <laughs> like you know, if there is like, you know, like there are these memes of you know people skipping leg day. Like, okay, but most people, even if they do skip, they do a couple of sets of leg extensions and leg presses. But hamstrings? <laughs> Half the people don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's and and you of course never care about your strong points. Like I have not like I don't have like good calves by like bodybuilding standards. So if I stood on a bodybuilding stage with other like bodybuilders who have good calves, like my calves would you know nothing special. But for someone who basically doesn't train calves, because basically what I noticed is either whether I train them or not, they just stay roughly at the same size. And but they're like good, like they're always there. Like <laughs> when I meet other people that are into fitness, they always comment on my calves. And it's like, well, if if I could just take size off my calves and distribute it on my biceps or have better ab insertions instead, more blocky abs, I would I would take that. Yeah, but you know, aside from the fact that people will, you know, sort of think of some memes when they see you, like nobody really cares. I mean, you don't even give, you don't get, uh, you basically you don't get this whatever. You're not punished or you know, don't receive a penalty at a contest because you have small calves from what I understand. So not even in bodybuilding contests, <laughs> calves are sort of the forgotten muscles. Like calves and forearms, nobody really cares about them. So yeah, they're small, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, just I wanted to sort of go back to that uh, volume thing because I have one more thing, which I guess we sort of touched on, but I guess it's worth touching on it again <laughs> and i sent you this message again like i think this is no no it's nothing personal against mike or, but i did notice that people once they start taking you know his words like special sports supplements they sort of forget what it's like to be natural <laughs> and i see this at the gym um the best example is probably <laughs> and i mentioned this to my colleague and he just started laughing as well you i think you heard this from dave mcconey and you mentioned this to me or you told the story uh, to me that uh bio street training whatever it is jerry ward or whatever his name is he started saying how you know he was i don't know i'm making up the stats he was maybe 180 uh, back when he was natural and now he's like 20 years later he's 200 so basically drugs did nothing because in 20 years he could have gained another 20 pounds easily natural <laughs> and, and that's the the perfect example of how drug users forget like how natural muscle building works it's not like yeah well things slow down but you know it's still the ball just the ball just keeps rolling and rolling it just starts rolling slower no the ball just stops and it's not moving. <laughs> That's it. It's not like you, well, you know, I initially gained like five pounds a year and then four. And then sort of I went down to one. But, you know, in the past 20 years, I would have still gained those one pound per year every year for the past 20 years. So I would have ended up in the same. No, <laughs> past maybe year one or two of those 20, you would have gained zero. A zero. Like Greg Dissett says. <laughs> And that would have been the end of it. And I see the same, like, Mike sometimes says things like, well, you know, if you train at MEV, you're going to gain minimal amount of muscle. Who wants to gain the minimum? <laughs> and, you know, we were laughing. And I sent you that message of, I do. I'm holding my hands up because you can see it. I, I do. Please, I want to gain minimum. I want to gain any amount. Like, anything is going to be welcome. Please, 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 please. A pound a year? Yes, please. <laughs> I'll be more than happy with that. <laughs> Who wants to gain the minimum? And it's so funny when he talks, well, you know, you wanna maybe you're gonna gain a bit more muscle, or you know, when he says in interviews, well, you know, um I'm really happy with my physique, but I sort of I want to do pump, put on a bit more muscle. And of course that's possible with drugs, like yeah. You can if you haven't exhausted all your possibilities, best uh, you know, at a certain point more is gonna equal more. Now, more is also going to equal more side effects and, uh, you know, more uh, risk um, for your health. But, yeah, more is more. I mean, just this last, uh, just yesterday, there was a guy who said that, you know, he put on, I don't know, how many thousands of euros into growth hormone, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And he basically then took off, like, three months lifting completely and he hasn't lost any size and he was still this strong and this and that. And the guy, of, of course, is genetically super strong. I mean, he has this huge... Like, basically, when he, we shake hands, I'm like, yeah, this motherfucker could just squeeze my hands and just, you know, break all the bones if he wanted to. <laughs> like, his hands are pretty much almost twice as big as mine, and his fingers are so thick and just... I don't know, maybe that's from the growth hormone, who knows. But, yeah, he's one of those just naturally strong people. And if you add the drugs on top of it, of course, he's super strong. 
Um, but yeah, that's sort of the the thing that, uh, and I've seen that with people. Now, of course, you do do see the opposite of people. Just <laughs> there's this other guy who said that. Well, I'm st- I started taking like trembolone and masterone and testosterone, and this and this and that. And I was like, I did a quick math, and I was like, that's a gram per week. And he was like, uh huh. And I was like, that's a lot. And he was like, no, that's not a lot. That's I mean, pros take, I don't know how many, and I was like, yeah, but you're not a pro. <laughs> like, you forgot to take a look at the mirror, like, you're not a pro. Like, you wouldn't even qualify at the local show, like, you're not a pro. A gram is a fuck ton. <laughs> so yeah, that's the other end of it. But yeah, um, so that's that's one thing that I'm sort of annoyed at when, you know, people who do use, just casually start throwing around terms like, what? why would you settle for the minimum amount of gains? Because I'm a fucking natural and I've been lifting for 10 years, that's why. And I don't have the luxury of upping my dose whenever I'm unsatisfied with the progress I'm making. I mean, I guess that's of course the option, but if you do leave drugs out, then, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, and this is a tricky one because, you know, for example, if now you know very well how the natural purgatory is when you're an advanced lifter. So if now let's say you were whatever body fat at 86 kilos and you started taking drugs now and in a couple of months you would go up to 96 kilos at the same body fat i would you know if i was a a, a client looking for a coach i would still be happy to seek you out as a coach because you know how to train a natural and you know how slow things can be you have the right perspective if eric helms or i could say myself of course if eric helms he knows exactly how it is like to work your ass off for nine years to put on maybe six pounds of muscle, you know. So if now he went on steroids and put on a whole bunch of muscle, that wouldn't just erase all his experience and perspective. But it's tricky when you got into steroids when you were, like maybe you had good genetics, so you made like really good gains before as well, which a lot of these guys do. And maybe you went on steroids when you were still kind of making gains and you just got like even more gains with steroids. It's tough because in many ways, I think these drugs or making your body do, which I guess it would do in an ideal scenario if you were natural. So yes, like probably a lot of these guys are just making steady gains. They're not just go on a steroid cycle and they put on 10 kilos in whatever, eight weeks, you know, they are putting on, you know, half a kilo, a kilo every month, month and a half. So over the course of a year, they just make some slow, steady gains. And in two years, it's like, okay, I'm definitely considerably bigger. And it's like, well, that's not crazy. So yes, of course, the drug t- drugs helped. But I mean, surely I could gain maybe half this much if I was natural. I think that's not, a, not an unreasonable perspective you have if you go down that route. But the reality is, at one point, it's not that you gain half as much. It's like you gain nothing versus you gain a decent amount. So, in, yeah, like if you put on in three years as an advanced lifter, you put on 10 kilos in three years as a, as a user. Like that's, you know, you look at that and, well, that's less than, you know, three kilos in a year. Like that's not that much. Maybe if I was natural, I would have gained five kilos in three years. It's like, no, if you were natural, maybe you wouldn't have gained anything in that amount, <laughs> exactly. in that time frame. So exactly. that's that's tricky. Uh, sounds like you wanted to say something. <laughs> no, I was, you know, it, it sort of got, uh, I got reminded of, Menno likes to say this, that past a certain point, you know, all of these advanced interventions it's not that uh, when you start making them, it's not like you're going to gain sort of a bit more than you would have otherwise. It's like if you haven't hadn't done those, you would have gained a whopping zero. <laughs> and maybe he's right. I don't know. Like uh, maybe that's the other thing. Because, um, for example, now what I do is uh, I focus on, you know, losing body fat. So I wake up and I go a couple of hours without eating protein, for example. Who knows, maybe if I woke up and drank a protein shake immediately and ha- started having protein every three hours, I'm skeptical that it would do anything because I still have like three to four protein feedings and the overall amount, I still average maybe three grams per kilo of protein a day. So I'm skeptical that it would do anything, but I'm sure that someone like Menno would say that uh, maybe I'm any amount of gains I still have left on the table, I'm leaving them there simply by, you know, going a couple of hours without protein. So maybe that's the last resort we could, uh, you know, <laughs> fall to. Yeah, and I and just going back to the drug users lose perspective. So I, you know, 
I'm going to leave Mike out of this because I feel like <laughs> I just I did a video on his progression method and whatever. So uh, I don't want to poop where I want to eat from. And everybody knows how much I respect Mike. So I'm not going to knock him. But there are a lot of these guys in the field who otherwise put out great information. So I'm going to throw Joe Bennett, the hypertrophy coach, under the bus a little bit, who, don't get me wrong, like when it comes to exercise selection, technique, all of these things, like top-notch information. But recently he put out the video which was about clean versus dirty bulking. And there he said things like, you know, for some people that thousand calorie surplus might be exactly what they need. And, uh, and I hear it from other people as well who otherwise have great information. Some of them have PhDs and stuff like you, ha- you gotta push the food because, you know, like otherwise you're, you're leaving gains on the table. And it's, I just like, it's not, I'm not, not calling them out. It's just when I hear that, I want to pause and ask, okay, like, are we talking about naturals now? Like, and it's fine if not, like, because I know you're working with a lot of enhanced guys. So it's fine if you're talking to them, but like naturals, for the most part, they don't freaking need to push the food, quote unquote. They don't need that thousand calorie surplus. Like any natural can do that. But we're talking about guys that weigh somewhere between like 70 and 90 kilos for the most part. And they're not lean usually when they are at that 90 kilo mark. Most of them aren't. So we're not talking about, you know, incredible caloric requirements here. So, you know, and, and that again, they just forget that, you know, most naturals, if they try to make gains by pushing the food, quote unquote, they will just get fat. There are some that won't, but that's like one in a thousand, basically. So if you're listening to that, dear listener, maybe you're that one person, but you're the exception, not the rule. So yeah, I think it's just easy to to lose that perspective, but I don't know if what can be done about that, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, what I do know is I have to run because... Uh... I'm supposed to be at work in like 15 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to wrap this up, and uh, we can we can touch on that whole diet and yeah, yeah. other issues I wanted to touch on uh, at some other time. 